If you enjoy the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentinterview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. But I was going to show this for the strafing discussion we're going to talk about uh, in just a minute. So Yeah, so let's get on to that incident. It's sure. very famous, isn't it? Uh, yeah. So can you tell us how it happened and just yeah, talk us through in detail? Sure. Um, you're asking about a deployment I was on in uh, 2002. So shortly after 9-11 happened, Operation Enduring Freedom kicked off. Uh, and then uh, we got tasked to deploy to the Middle East in January of 2002. And so at the time, there were no fighter bases in any American bases in Afghanistan at the time. So we forward deployed to Al Jabra Air Base in Kuwait. And we did a mix of missions. We still, the no-fly zone in Iraq was still ongoing, so we had Northern Watch and Southern Watch uh, going on. So some of our sorties were to enforce the no-fly zone in Southern Iraq, and then also we were doing missions in Afghanistan. So wow. we were taking off out of Kuwait, and if you've looked at a map of the Middle East, Kuwait and Afghanistan aren't necessarily that close to each other. So uh, we would take off and fly for about three and a half hours uh, down the Arabian Gulf, cross UAE, get some gas from tankers, and then we'd turn uh, north fly through Pakistan or over Pakistan and then uh, get to Afghanistan after about three and a half hours and then we would do about a three hour vol uh, a period uh, supporting folks on the ground that needed us and then uh, we would return back to base. Most missions to Afghanistan were about 10 to 11 hours long, five to six aero fueling, so they're pretty long. Um, and when we got to the Middle East in January of 2002, the previous squadron the th uh, that we replaced, the 391st fighter squadron out of a uh, mountain home uh, Idaho had did a majority of the work to uh, uh, help overthrow uh, the Taliban and, uh, and, and get after some of the Al Qaeda leadership uh, that were in Afghanistan. So we showed up in January, it was pretty quiet. From January to February, uh, there wasn't much activity, uh, but intel was showing there were some pockets of uh, forces, Al Qaeda forces, in, the, uh, in eastern Afghanistan. And so uh, they put together. Uh, an operation called Operation Anaconda, which was to, to put some U.S. and coalition forces around the remaining, what they thought to be the last remaining forces in Afghanistan of the Al-Qaeda uh, forces. And they did concentric circles of defenses around it, and that's why they called it Afghanistan uh, Anaconda, sorry, uh, because that's how anacondas kill their prey, and they put a squeeze on them. Well, we happened to be airborne on the second day of Operation Anaconda on the 3 and 4 March. Uh, when a uh, bad situation happened. Uh, there was a Chinook that was infilling a Navy, uh, Navy SEAL team on top of a mountain about 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, unfortunately, as they were settling down, that Chinook got shot. Uh, and as they were, they had the door down uh, on the back end of the Chinook, and uh, they started getting shot out, and the Chinook flew away. And the, uh, one of the Navy SEALs uh, fell out of the, uh, slipped out of the backside of that Chinook and ended up on top of a snow covered mountain surrounded by enemy forces. And uh, unfortunately, he was succumbed to uh, by enemy um, you know, uh, bullets and uh, was later killed on top of that mountain. Uh, another rescue helicopter came up, dropped off the, that SEAL team uh, a couple hours later. And, uh, and a fight ensued on top of that mountain. Uh, and one of those uh, folks that was part of that Navy SEAL team was an airman called uh, Tech Sergeant. His name was Tech Sergeant John Chapman. and would later receive the Medal of Honor for his actions up on that hill. Uh, that team had to uh, basically leave the top of the mountain because they were uh, obviously being, um, they encountered heavy resistance from the enemy. And so about six or seven in the morning, another, a third helicopter went to the top of the mountain. And that one got struck by a rocket propelled grenade and actually crash landed on the mountain. And within a couple minutes, four army uh, soldiers uh, were killed. And so we happened to be airborne working with another special ops team um, in a valley about four or five miles away and eventually got called over to provide uh, close air support to them. And so. Uh, the way the helicopter landed and where they were in relation to the uh, enemy bunker, they were very close. They were about 75 meters away. And so employing laser-guided weapons that we talked about earlier, it was too dangerous because any of the, you know, once the 
500 pound weapon would go off. Uh, our friendly forces were well inside the dangerous uh, area for those bombs and so there's a high probability that they would also be part of uh, the target. So. Um, so we got airborne, we were talking to them on the ground and uh, the sun had come up so we could see where the helicopter was. They told us the enemy is in these clump of trees. We did a quick talk on and they cleared us for some gun passes. And uh, the first time we, our flight lead actually, I was in the number two of a two ship. And the first time our, uh, our lead aircraft went down to strafe, um, which is, we call strafe is using the gun to hit targets on the ground. Um, the friendly forces were so close to the uh, enemy forces when he went down the first time and he pulled the trigger they couldn't tell if the f-15 was pointing at the enemy bunker or the helicopter that's how close these two wow. were so they called a quick abort 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 as he pulled the trigger and then he, uh, he did a safe escape and uh, we worked it around where they want us to come in at a, at a different attack axis and so we started um, strafing this way and, uh, and slowly started to um, I guess decrease the enemy presence on the top of that mountain. So, uh, and the, another reason I brought this, uh, why it was kind of a, a kind of a big deal, is um, one is the first time we'd ever done emergency close air support. Emergency close air support uh, for any of our aircraft means that we've got friendly forces, you know, in close proximity to the enemy, and also within our weapons employment zones. And so, um, so pretty precise uh, requirement uh, when we uh, use our our weapons. And so. Uh, Shooting the gun at the ground was something that we never did in the F-15. None of us were qualified to do close air support. Nobody had ever, you know, other than a few instances leading up to this uh, this day, very few folks have shot the that shot the gun in the F-15E, let alone at the at the ground. And so, what was unique about this one? One was just a different sight picture coming down the uh, down the chute. Also, the gun in the F-15E is canted two degrees up, and so it was made for dogfighting. So that when you're dogfighting, you know, when you pull the trigger. The bullets are already creating a little bit of lead, just like skeet shooting. You want to pull a little bit of lead in order to hit the target. Well, the same design concept was in the F-15E uh, gun, so or the F-15 gun, both the C and the E. Well, point at the ground, you actually have to point your nose short of the target mm. in order for the bullets to hit the target. So it's just a slightly different uh, sight picture for uh, the pilots, and so um, we carry about five to five hundred rounds, uh, a, a twenty millimeter. Uh, rounds in the, in the gun and so it gives us enough for about five or six passes we squeeze the trigger for about a second and uh, so we it didn't take us long to run out of bullets we still had a lot of bombs on on board uh, later on during the mission um, the enemy was reinforcing uh, there was another casualty up on top of the mountain and uh, they the guys up on the mountain came up with a plan hey can you drop GB12s at these particular places we will hide behind these rocks and kind of cross our fingers. And um, so uh, we ended up employing some GB-12s, you know, about 75 meters to 100 meters from, from failing forces. And so it was, uh, it was definitely a, um, it was a interesting story to be a part of. Obviously, uh, uh, it was great to support the guys on the ground. Unfortunate about, about what was going on, on top of that mountain. Uh, but that ended up being about a six hour mission just about, just uh, wow. providing support to them. Wow. And how did you feel personally? Did it feel very rewarding to be a part of that mission? Uh, after the fact, potentially. I, uh, during the mission, it was frustrating. It took so long because uh, there was, at the time, there was just a lot of confusion, fog and friction in, in, in the battle space. Uh, you had the the main fight was happening in this valley about two or three miles away. You had B-52s that were trying to drop in this valley that were two or three miles away. So if they wanted to drop, we had to leave, disengage from the guys on top of the mountain, disengage out to the uh, out to the east against the Pakistan border, while they tried to get clearance. We had predators in our supporting other folks on the ground. We had EP-3 in our cast wheel uh, that was in the altitude that we were trying to employ weapons at. And a lot of those folks were on different frequencies. And so uh, we didn't have any A-10s there at the time. So we had no forward air controller airborne uh, to provide us um, uh, FAC-A responsibilities of deconflicting fires. Uh, we did not have, unfortunately, due to force cap limitations on the deployments across the, the military, you know, they did not deploy all the airmen that typically go with the Div Army Division. So the 101st Airborne Division didn't have their f uh, full suite of Air Support Operations Center, which is airmen that help support the ground units. And so we didn't have everybody in the AOR at the time to, um, 
to support them the best way we could. So it was a bit frustrating in that in that mm. in that regard. Uh, and then no, as we're flying home, just knowing that they're still on top of that mountain, mm. and you know we can't do anything about it. You know, the, yeah. So it was a bit frustrating. It was yes, it was nice to be air. It was great to be airborne and employ an airplane to help support those guys on the ground because eventually it led to the rescue of uh, 23 folks later on that night. Uh, but I, you know we weren't thumping our chest or anything like that because uh, we later learned that folks died on top of that mountain so it wasn't anything that we were cheering about for sure. Did you hear back from any of the guys that got saved there? Yeah, we uh, later met up with one of the ETACs, enlisted terminal air controllers, so Staff Sergeant uh, Kevin Vance was on top of that mountain and later received the Silver Star for his actions up on top of that mountain. But he was stationed at Fort Bragg at the time, he was part of the 75th Ranger Regiment in North Carolina which is an army unit, but we stick airmen in there to help uh, help plan and integrate uh, air and ground operations. So we met him uh, a few months later. Uh, we invited him up to North Carolina, uh, to, our, uh, to our squadron. Uh, he briefed us on the ground situation, kind of his experiences on the ground. We briefed him our experiences from the air. We exchanged coins and patches, and then we brought him to our squadron bar uh, and introduced him to Jeremiah Weed and did a couple oh, yeah. shots with him, which he loved, and then uh, proceeded to have a good day in the bar. But uh, it was great to meet with him after the fact and kind of learn uh, kind of hit from his perspective mm -hmm. how it went up on top of that mountain. I mean, obviously that's a very memorable story, but do you have any others you can share with us from your time on the Eagle? Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> we could be here all day. We should fire up the, uh, fire up the bar. Um, yeah, I mean, it just... Being able to deploy all around the world, I mean, at times here in, in Europe, I uh, got a lot of opportunities to train with other air forces. I uh, did a blue flag in Israel for three weeks, and so I got a chance to fly with the Israelis, uh, the Greeks, and the Italians. We all met up down there in, uh, in Israel for three weeks, just training with them and flying low level over the Dead Sea, which Dead Sea is below sea level, so our radar, or our uh, altimeter, MSL, mean sea level, said minus 600 feet as we're flying. It just, it just looked odd, you know. So they got a chance to fly with them, got a chance to fly with the Spanish F-18s down in, uh, mm -hmm. in Spain. Uh, just some great training opportunities mm -hmm. uh, throughout the world and just flying the F-15. Yeah, because the Israelis fly the F-15, don't they? They do, yeah. They've got, yeah, they got a Strike Eagle version. They also got an F-15C model version. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, they have very similar um, yeah. platforms. Mm -hmm. So how many hours did you get on the Strike Eagle? Uh, just over 2,000, you know, which is, uh, it took me a long time to get there. You know, I didn't have a lot of deployments and so, uh, but 2,000 hours, I had an absolute blast and uh, I certainly do miss it, but uh, uh, I had very content on my time in there and lucky to, very fortunate to fly that airplane. And how would you sum up the Eagle? Ah, she's a beauty. Um, <laughs> uh, it is a, uh, there's lots of terms we use for that. Mac Air Warhorse, uh, because McDonnell Douglas was the original builder of it. But uh, she's a warhorse, and uh, a war fighting death dealer is, is a lot, uh, another term we use. But she was built for war. She was war built for combat, uh, survivable, can fight her way in, self protection, so she can fight her way in and fight her way out and hit the target. And so, just a joy to fly. It's powerful, has long legs in terms of uh, fuel, and uh, very capable. You know, since Desert Storm, she's been performing extremely well. Obviously, it, um, it, it goes without saying, but uh, the maintenance team behind all that, that airplane, you know, she's, she's pretty old. Uh, <laughs> so they take good care of her. And then also the, uh, the air crew and the instructors that have helped build the air crew up to be able to deploy year after year after year and employ that successfully. Uh, she's just, she's a, she was a joy to fly. I've got a few personal questions here for you, Chris. So what's the relationship like between pilots and wizards? Oh, it's a wonderful relationship. <laughs> no, it's, it's really good. I mean, we're all part of one, one team, right? So uh, no, the banter back and forth is collegial, um, but uh, there's value and mutual respect between both of them. And there's not this big divide between pilots and wizards that I've seen in, in, throughout my career. We work well together. Uh, we're all considered one, one team. And so um, the, the only, you know, if, if there's anything, you, you may have a young, young air crew in one of those two positions, um, it, it just takes them a while to get them up to speed. Maybe you have an experienced person in the front and a young wizzo in the back. Right, yeah. You know, so at, at times for the guy flying in the front, it's a lot of patience, you know, to get, get him up to speed just because it's all part of the process, uh, you know, and as you become a senior wizzo instructor evaluator and you've got a young pilot in the front seat, it's going to take you a lot more saying stuff to the front seat or, hey, you know, do this, do that. Uh, but over time, the whole purpose is to build, a, you know, a good partnership. So when you go down range, you go down, you deploy into combat. 
you've got a good relationship with each other and uh, you can kind of anticipate what that person's thinking, what the other person's thinking and work well together to employ that airplane. So I want uh, um, for me to ask you, how did you get your call sign? <laughs> Spliff, this is a story for at least a beer, but um, <laughs> it is uh, a, a two-part story. It's two words put together, splat and sniff to form spliff. Uh, and they're two embarrassing stories. Um, but uh, <laughs> splat is first day of egress hanging harness training, so ejection seat training in the F-15. Uh, we sit through an hour academics and the, uh, I get the first question, kind of stump the dummy question. Not really stumped a dummy, just kind of testing our knowledge, and apparently I failed. But uh, he asked me, hey, Lieutenant, you eject out of the F-15, and your parachute doesn't open. You just see it, you know, you look up, and it's just, um, it doesn't fully open. They call it a streamer. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking back, like, during the academics, I'm like, I don't think this guy talked about it. I go, well, I think I would cut it away and pull my spare chute. And as soon as those words came out of my mouth, I'm like, ah, we only have one parachute in the, the ACES-2 ejection seat. I was like, nah, scratch that, scratch that. And the whole class was laughing, you know, and I was like, nah, I wouldn't do that, you know. And uh, anyway, that story made it back to one of the naming ceremonies, you know, a few months later. So that was, so if I would have cut away that spare chute, or that parachute, sorry, my primary spare parachute, I would hit the ground and splatted like a pancake. Um, the second one, sniff, is a, a particular radar mode in our, uh, in our radar where it's kind of a passive, it doesn't emit any energy. And uh, I was in my combat squadron and I was crewed with the student pilot. So student pilot in the front, student pilot in the back. It was the ride before our final check ride to be combat ready, you know, air crew. And we were going out to a, a bombing range in North Carolina. And the first couple bombs were supposed to be WIZO bombs. So we were supposed to find the target on the radar, you know, pass the designation to the front seater and the front seater would fly, fly the little line and pick and uh, release the weapon. Well, we're going, this is where 4G's ended up impacting, <laughs> you know, being right heads down. 4G's impacted, so the, the, every time we turn in that pattern, it's a 4G turn. Well, the push button to get the radar pointing to the target is right next to the push button that puts it in a passive mode, into the sniff mode. And so, I'm under G, and I went to go put the radar pointing to the target, and I accidentally hit the button, uh, the wrong button. So the radar looks like it's, I mean, it's sweeping. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting for some sort of return to come back in the, you know, in my, my up front or my display, and nothing comes back. And I'm like, this isn't right. So we have to turn final because we're going to run into the edge of the airspace. So I can't get a designation. We go through dry, which means we don't drop a bomb. We come back around again. The, the, the uh, radar is still stuck in that mode. We go through dry again, and I'm still I'm struggling in the back seat. I'm like, what is going on? So my pilot's like, hey, let me do a visual delivery up here. I'll drop. I got this bomb. You know, figure out what's going on in the back seat. And so he drops a weapon, and he, he thinks it's the right target. It's the wrong target. It looks very similar, but they're about a half a mile, a mile apart. So he, he drops a bomb, and they go, unscorable at 3 o'clock, number two. And we're like, unscorable? That looked pretty good to us. Uh, we go around again. He gets the same score, unscorable at 2, or unscorable at uh, 3 o'clock, number two. Hmm. And all of a sudden, it was really dry, and that second bomb set fire to the range and burned oh. like all wow. the shrubbery. And so we get kicked off the range. They have to close the range. So we're flying back home. I couldn't drop a bomb from the back seat. He sets fire to the range. And we're like, God, we suck. <laughs> you know, how do we get to this airplane? So that was, and once we're flying and, and returning back home, I hit the push button and the, the radar started working, to get, working again. So splat, sniff, form spliff. And uh, that's how I got my call sign. And I grew up in Colorado, and Colorado is known for um, marijuana. They, they were like the first state to legalize marijuana, I think. But spliff is another word for a, a joint. That's and, what and they always called, said, yeah. they always like, this guy's always laid back. Is he smoking a spliff, splat, sniff, spliff? It all came out in a naming ceremony. And uh, so that's the name the, uh, the fighter gods gave me. So Brilliant. <laughs> so do you have any hobbies? Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, I enjoy playing golf. It's a good exercise. I, I try to walk uh, if I do play golf. So I enjoy golf. It's just time consuming and expensive sport. But uh, <laughs> uh, golf, fitness, I enjoy uh, working out and uh, walking and, uh, um, and then traveling with my wife. You know, we try to travel as much as we can. We've been to many different countries uh, around Europe and, uh, and wonderful places around the UK. I know the answer to this probably. Favorite aircraft you've flown? Oh, certainly. That's an easy one. F-15E. Is there an aircraft you have loved to have flown in or flown or operated? Um, I guess since my dad flew F-4s, you know, I'd love to go back and fly the F-4, just sit in the back seat and get a ride uh, in the F-4 and just kind of experience what he, he flew back in his day. That's probably the biggest one. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, what are you currently up to? 
Uh, I retired from the Air Force uh, last summer. I spent 26 years in the Air Force. Had an awesome, awesome time uh, serving with other airmen and working with other uh, joint partners. But I retired and uh, now I work for Boeing. I'm a F-15 simulator site manager. So I've got uh, some folks that look after the sim and look after the facilities and I have a dream job because I'm still close to the F-15E community. I'm working for a company that uh, I love and obviously have a lot of, um, you know, they built the aircraft that took me to combat and brought me uh, safely home and able to navigate through mountains at night under terrain falling radar. I just got to, you know, that was the one company that I'd prefer to work for after I, I got out of the Air Force. And so I'm doing that now. Well, certainly you've had an amazing career to date, but uh, Chris, thank you very much for coming on yeah. the show. Hey, you're welcome, Mike. It was great to chat with you. Thank you.